Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again you are giving us the opportunity to share these biblical principles with everyone, but especially you are helping us to demonstrate our love for Roman Catholics and for anyone who doesn't know the Lord, that we openly will share with them with a great deal of concern for their eternity. I pray, my Lord, that whoever listens to this series, that they will fully realize that we are not criticizing the Roman Catholics, but we are just informing anyone who is not a biblical Christian that there is no other way to come to heaven but through the trust and faith in Christ alone. And if they follow any other doctrine, it's a secure way to eternal damage, to eternal punishment. And we pray, my Lord, that you will empower us with the Holy Spirit to understand and to speak in a way that is glorifying to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, as you probably see, soon after the Roman Catholic system became Roman, before it was Catholic, uh, things began to deteriorate and one of the things that they began to do was to use images and, and crucifix and statues and all kinds of things. It was sad to see the Pope last week kneeling in front of the statue of the Virgin Mary and consecrating both the Ukraine and Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And to see something like that, it really uh, sends a message of a religion that is not biblical, that violates all principles of the of the Bible. The Ten Commandments, and you don't have that with you there, but I can make copies later on. The Ten Commandments are um, written in Exodus 20 from 2 to 17, from Deuteronomy uh, 5, 6 to 21. And in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses explained again the Ten Commandments. He did not receive it again. He received them in the Mount Sinai. And, but all through the 40 years almost, or 30 some years of traffic through the desert, they forgot it. So he reminded them again and put, put them back into the Bible. Well, the Roman Catholic Church did basically the same thing, but they took, and I hope that the camera will be able to see that, and probably you will be able to see that, but I'm going to show it to you right here. The first commandment is right here. Those three things. 
The second commandment is right here, but there is nothing The second commandment is right here, but there is nothing here in Roman Catholicism. What they did is they wrote down the following. The Ten Commandments, according to Exodus, the Ten Commandments, according to Deuteronomy, and the Ten Commandments, according to a tradi traditional catechetical formula. In other words, they dismiss what the scriptures say and they establish their own. What is sad about this is the following. And I'm going to read from the catechism. As you see, the first commandment is there. The second commandment is here according to the Bible, but there is nothing in the church. And then in order to keep the Ten Commandments, they divided the last commandment, the, the tenth, into two. And in that way, they complete. Now, I'm showing this to you because it is a sad thing that you dismiss the word of God by the traditions of men. And what do you think the second commandment says? I'm going to read from the Roman Catholic Catechist, from Exodus. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing a steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. I am reading from the Catechist. And then, according to um, Deuteronomy, second commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And from the Roman Catholic, Commandments, zero, nothing. And then, obviously, the 10th commandment, it says in the Bible, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or his maidservant, or the ox, or his donkey, or anything that you, you, that is your neighbor's. That's the 10th commandment, according to Exodus, according to Deuteronomy. Neither shall you covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire anything that is your neighbor's. That's Deuteronomy uh, chapter 5, 6 to 21. And in the Roman Catholic, they divide that commandment into two. You shall not cover, not ninth, you, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife. And tenth, you shall not cover your neighbor's good. They divided this into two. It's like you should not cover it with your right eye. And your, well, in other, words, like, in other words, the commandment against coveting your, the neighbor's wife is already prescribed in the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. Now, obviously, the church imposed these idols 
And the reason why there is nothing here in the commandments according to the Roman Catholic Church is because they still have the idols and the idols will represent the person that they worship. But in fact, they worship the idols. And so Roman Catholic says to us, especially to me when I travel, don't you have a picture of your wife in your wallet? You love your wife. And you speak about Mimi all the time. Do you have a picture of her in your wallet? The same thing we do with God. We love him so much that we keep a picture or the Virgin Mary or a saint. And I said, I don't keep a picture of Mimi in my wallet at all because I keep her in my heart because I think of her. If I, to keep a picture in my wallet, to think about Mimi is an insult to Mimi, isn't it? Because I should not use anything. She lives in my heart and in my mind and is, I see it as the most precious gift that God has given me after Jesus. I don't have to give. And that's the same thing with God. Now, God, uh, if you go for a second to Isaiah 44, verse 6 and on, the Lord is explicit on his concern about having other gods. And he begins saying like this, that says the Lord, the King of Israel. And I'm reading from Isaiah 44, verse 6. The King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people, he, he created everything. And the things that are coming and shall come, the, the sovereignty of God, a big God. Let them show this to them. Do not fear. Do not, do not be afraid. Have I told you from time and declare it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. And then he says, but you do make idols and you are foolish. And I'm going to make fun of you. And I'm going to laugh of you. This is God. I prefer God to laugh at me today and turn my heart so I don't have to endure his wrath for eternity. And here is God laughing at this. We are in chapter 44, verse 9 of Isaiah. <clears throat> Those who make an image, all of them are useless and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witness. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? You know, you have to be blind and, and, and deaf. You do not know God. Anyone who makes an image does not know God. Surely all his companions would be ashamed and the workmen, they are mere, mere men. Let them be all be gathered together. Let them stand up, yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. 
because this is what they do. Verse 12, the blacksmith with the tongues works one of the coals, fashion it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out of the chalk with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass and makes it and makes it like a figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedar from himself and takes the cypress and the oak. He secured it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, and then he rain, rain, rain uh, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself, put it in the stove. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. He cooks with it. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it, he makes it a god, into a god. His carved image, he falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. Isn't it amazing? Plants a tree, sees growing it, the tree, cuts the tree. With parts of the tree, he makes furniture. With the other parts of the tree, he warms himself, he cooks with it. And whatever is left, he makes a little image and bows down in front of him. Is that, isn't that foolish? I'm not saying this. It is the Bible who says this. Look at this. They do not know or understand. They do not know God. Why? For he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see and their hearts so they cannot understand. And no one considered in his heart, nor is their knowledge not understanding to say, I had burned half of it on the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on its coals. I have roasted meat and eaten it. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Notice that God calls it an abomination. Shall I fall down before a block of wood? It was sad to see the Pope doing that last week. You probably saw it. It was in the news. He was kneeling in front of the statue of Mary dedicating Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Conception and praying to this piece of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has torn him aside and he cannot deliver his soul nor say, is there no life in my right hand? This does not have life, nothing. Uh, now, if you go for a second to Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, to um, Psalm 115, First of all, is the beautiful prayer that we always should say, I, you know, and, and, and I, have, I have that big temptation. As God continues to 
to, to, to build SRL. And in Mexico, just, just got the news that the place that they, we sent the missionary, they spent almost three years working with the missionary until the church and the organization discovered that he could be ordained. He was ordained as a pastor this past week. And the church grew so much that they had to move out to a larger church. In Argentina, you got the letter of the month. 50 new students in a secular university. And when people come and say, wow, Noé, you're really, you, listen to this, you are really doing a lot of things. Whoa, whoa. Listen to this prayer. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so there is, so where is their God? Never for a second we did anything. It is God. But then God says this, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. God is in control. Now, what do the idols can do? Their idols are silver and gold. The work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they have do not hear. Noses, they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet, but they have, they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who makes them, listen to that, are just like them. So it is everyone who trusts in them. And they say, well, that's only in the Old Testament. But if you go to the book of Romans, chapter 1, in, in the book of Romans, it says that people have turned their back to God. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them us on giving up to uncleanliness. That they is the corruption of idols. God hates idols. If you go through this, the main reason why Israel was, was taken into, the, into Babylon was because of what? Idolatry. Idolatry is the main sin that men committed. And Calvin used to say, uh, the, heart, the heart, the man of the heart is a what? It's a factory of idols. Because soon thereafter, you become, you, be, you become your own idol. And when we get angry at people, and when we criticize people, and when people don't say hello to us, and we get angry, is because we had become idols. We want people to worship us. Wow. In any event, that is the reason why in the Ten Commandments, God forbids that. Because it is foolishness. I have hundreds of stories about this, but I don't dare to take the time because we will never finish this. Okay, we arrive <clears throat> last 
weak on the fact that the title of Pope, verse 12, um, uh, oh, pardon me, um, 11, prayers directed to Mary, dead saints, and angels. God forbids prayers to anybody. It has to be directed to, their, to him. Why? Because we are a royal priesthood. How do we demonstrate that we are royal priesthoods? Because when Jesus on the cross says, all is finished, what happened to the veil of the temple? <laughs> Rip apart. And the priests were the only ones who could cross the veil. When they rip the, the, the veil of the temple, rip, all of us has access to the Father. So we are royal priesthoods in, in that sense. So there is not. Now, why not to pray to Mary? I already said that before. <laughs> because she is not divine. If she were if she was divine, if she were, were divine, she will be omnipresent and will be able to listen to everyone everywhere. But that is an attribute of God alone. The, in in, in um, Jeremiah chapter 7, and I'd like you to please go there, Verse 18, see, the tradition of the Roman Church made Mary not only the Immaculate Conception, but also the Queen of Heaven and the Queen of the Universe and all of this. But look what the Bible says. Verse 18, the children gather wood the fathers kindle the fire, and the women need dough to make cakes for who? For the queen of heaven. And they put out drinks offerings to other gods. That is another god. The queen of heaven is, an, and notice that is a small g to other gods. That they, that they may provoke me <coughs> to anger. The moment you pray to anybody else and you call Mary the queen of heaven, you are provoking God to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they do not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out on this place. And then when they kind of force Jeremiah to go to Egypt, when the people of Israel were suffering and they had been already, the majority of them had already been taken to Babylon, Jeremiah stay in Israel, in, uh, in, in Judea. And they were afraid. So they asked Jeremiah to consult God, Jehovah, as to what they should do. And Jeremiah said, obey the Lord, do exactly what the Lord asks you, be good. And they told them, and they told Jeremiah that whatever the Lord would say, they will do. And after Jeremiah said that, they say, no, we are going to Egypt. Said so the, the Lord says, don't go to Egypt. And he says, yes, and, the, and it's, uh, seems to be that they kidnap, it, kidnap uh, Jeremiah into Egypt. But why did they go to Egypt? They disobey God and they heard messages from the Queen of Heaven. And it seems to be that they believe more the Queen of Heaven, which is not Mary, the mother of our Lord. She is not the Queen of Heaven. 
She is the beautiful Mary, the woman that God chose before the foundations of the world to be the mother of my Savior. She is beautiful. We love her, and she is in heaven, and we honor her. But this is another God. Let me show you who he is. Verse and Jeremiah 44, verse 15. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, with all the women who stood by, a great multitude, and all of the people who dwell in the land of Egypt, in Paros, answered Jeremiah, saying, as for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. Wow. But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to who? To the Queen of Heaven and put out drinks, offerings to her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. For then, when we had plenty of food, we're well off, and so no trouble. But since we stop burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and put our drinks offerings to her, we have lacked everything and has been consumed by the sword and by famine. They believe that because they stop worshiping another God, which is in the Bible, the Queen of Heaven, and reading from the Bible, I'm not making this up. Then they, well, what we are saying here is that that is an idol. Now, if you go to uh, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, Mary has appeared in many places. You know that. In Fatima, in Lourdes, in uh, Mexico, Guadalupe, in so many places. So the question that they pose to us, the Roman Catholics, do we deny the apparitions of Mary and saints? And the answer to this is no, we do not deny that. Because how can we deny that thousands and millions of people go there and they have this? What we deny is that those apparitions are not Mary. The, those apparitions are straight from hell and it's Satan himself appearing as the figure of a woman or a saint because Satan is the great liar and he's able to imitate the voices of people and appear as an angel of light. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. <clears throat> and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Why, uh, why are we saying that this is not Mary? Mary loves Jesus. So she is not going to say, pray for me, like in Fatima, so I convert Russia. Do you remember that's the message? And the Pope was trying these past months to uncover some secret messages from Fatima. It is, it, it is a religion that is taking people to hell because it's about this world. We want to know the future. We want to know more. And God says, no, the future is not for us to see. We are under the providence of God. 
Mary loves Jesus. So she's not going to take the place of Jesus. She knows the gospel. She said in the second chapter of John, whatever he tells you, you do. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but through me. Whatever you ask, ask in my name. Through me, I am the way. Nobody else. Do not replace me. And Mary is not going to replace his son. If it was Mary, he, she will say, trust in my son, believe in him, and you shall be saved. But none of those messages appear in those apparitions. Not a single of those messages. I will say, Russia, if you pray the rosary every day, I keep your family together. If you do this, you do the other. This, I'll do this for you. If you wear the scapular and you go to hell, I will go there after nine days and I will take you out of hell and take you to heaven. Is that the gospel? It's, it's terrifying. That's why it says the it destroys the heart, destroys the ear. You don't see. It's like you become stupid. It's stupidity. And in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, If I or an angel from heaven will teach you another gospel, let it be what? A curse, condemn, anathema. For those reasons, so uh, it's interesting that they will throw at you Samuel chapter um, 28. And um, Saul, this is, you see, the Bible shows that people come from other, from eternity to talk to you. When you go, and I hope you don't, to, a, to an espiritist, and many people do. They call their mothers, their parents, their friends, their sons, because they want to talk to them. And guess what? These people say, it is true. It's my mother's voice. It is, I cannot deny that. It's my mother's voice. Satan imitates the voice of anybody. I know a priest who confesses, who is into spiritism, and confesses people who had already died. And they come and confess, even um, Napoleon came to confess in French. <coughs> and so, it is unbelievable. <coughs> but it is Satan himself, who not only <coughs> imitates and the wishes, the witches. Know this. They don't know because they are in communication with Satan. That's, that, that world exists. Pastor Borg explains that angels exist and angels heavenly angels and demons. Now, when he said last night that every one of us have an angel, I wanted to scream from my seat and say, Hebrews 1.14, Hebrews 1.14, where he says that to everyone who has been chosen, an angel was given to you. Not to the ones who are not chosen. Hebrews 1.14, if you want to remember. It's an interesting thing. But look at what happened here in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, the Saul departed. I mean, God departed from Saul. Saul did not have any relationship with God any longer. And he was extremely afraid. He was going to go into battle. And he decided to go not to God, but to what? To a witch. 
And he went to the witch. And the king says to her in chapter 28, verse 13 of First Samuel. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. What is that? So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. See, at the end of this interview, uh, now he is convinced that it's Samuel. But it is Satan himself because Samuel is in heaven. He's not going to come to to, to say that satanic encounter with the witch. So he perceived it. So what he thought that it was Samuel, he says, I am in deep distress and so on, and I am not going to take all the time to talk about this. But at the end, he's the, the Satan and even the witch can perceive that he was afraid. That he was not in any, any state of mind to fight the Philistines. He was going to that battle with fear. He already had lost the battle. He, so it was easy to predict that the next day he was going to die and, and his sons too. And Samuel says, and you will be with me tomorrow. I have to tell you, I have doubts that Saul is in heaven. So he could not be with Samuel the next day. So again, these are dangerous things, but I am not going to take any more time on this. But that's why we do not pray to Mary or to anyone or to dead saints or to angels. Even, even, even John, the Apostle John, fell into this in, in, on, on, on a moment when the angel spoke to John in, the, in, in, in Revelation. What did John do? Fell on his knees. And the angel says, not me. <laughs> Say, okay, okay. See, always there is that tendency when you see something to, to, to believe. But God is very serious about it. Pope Boniface the third, uh, he was the first, um, the first pope, the first to receive the title of pope, but received the title of pope by an emperor. Now I have to tell you, Boniface the third was the one who said that out of the Roman Catholic Church there is no salvation. And then the Council of Trent confirmed that and said, the Council of Trent said, if you, if you denied that out of the Roman Catholic Church there is no salvation, you are already condemned. And, and they add hundreds of condemnations, even if you believe in Jesus, even if you trust in Jesus, but you do not believe that you are not in the Roman Catholic Church you are condemned. Of course, that was changed later on on this catechism with the ecumenism with everyone, uh, where everyone will go to heaven. Um, then in verse in, in number 14, uh, the Pope, and I, I, I am sure I'm not going to have the time to go through the history of the Popes. You might have to do that yourself. you know. But when the Pope was attacked by the Huguenots and by the uh, north of Italy, the Pope ran to the 
King Pepin in France, and the king of the Franks came and defended the Pope, restored all the all the lands and all that belongs to the Pope, and then uh, the son of Pepin is Charlemagne, and Charlemagne was was um, uh, crowned by the Pope as the new emperor of the Roman Empire, the new emperor. So you can see that, how you can exchange. Now in number 15, in 786, they authorize the worshiping of the cross images and relics, authorize by the Pope. Uh, in 16, uh, in 850, Holy water was mixed with a pinch of salt and blessed by the priests. And people can wait until they get the water. You know, if a drop of water touches you, you are safe. Um, then I like to go to number 18. Then number 18 in 927. Now, this is very important because before 927, the majority of the popes were elected by the civil government, by emperors or by kings. Actually, uh, you remember that after the French fell, then the, the government of Constantinople began to elect popes. And then after the Constantinople fell uh, to the Germans, the Germans began to elect popes and, and so on. So um, in 927, for the first time, was established the College of Cardinals, which is the ones who now elect the pope. Um, number 20, we already talked last Monday about the canonization of dead saints. And, uh, and you know uh, that that doctrine is false because saints are not dead. The saints that are here are alive. And the saints that are in heaven are alive. So, um, Nine, nine, uh, number 21, fasting on Friday and during Lent. That is, that was established in the year 998. You could not eat meat on Friday. You have to fast on, on the Fridays. You have to do a lot of things during the holidays. I remember that we couldn't even listen to music, to loud music. Everything it went back to the to the system of the Jewish traditions of the Pharisees. Um, this is contradicting uh, the book of Colossians, Coloss Colossians chapter one verse 23 on where it says do not go do not continue with doctrines of men uh, where they prohibit you uh, what to eat and what and and, and and the and the feast and they even prohibit you from marrying which are doctrines of demons literally and timothy co uh, confirms that those are doctrines of demons God says, man shall not be alone. And you will see soon how the, uh, the celibacy in verse uh, no, number 23 was established in 1079. Before that, the priest could get married. But the church was very concerned about 
uh, the inheritance for the children. So we'll own the parishes and the churches and so on. And to eliminate that and control the wealth of the church, they eliminate marriage for the priests. And now you have these problems where there, are, there is all kind of immorality and the church trying to cover up. And uh, they have paid millions of dollars to settle cases that are very well known of immorality. Uh, so the celibacy of the priests in, in the 11th century, in the 11th century, no, 1079, what century is that? 11th century is, was established. Now, 22, the mass developed gradually as a sacrifice with attendance made obligatory in the 11th century. Now, let me tell you something about this. The mass is the centrality, the centrality of Roman Catholicism, worship it. And I did not know this, <laughs> but I was reading today and listening. They have established every single movement in the mass that has to be just so perfect. You have to kneel 11 times. You have to uh, do this in your chest so many times. You have to mention certain words so many times. You have to kneel. All of these things are there. And if you miss one of those, your mass might not be valid. But what is a shame is a priest writing this book, and I will bring that the name of the of the book next week. I, I forgot to mention is one of the of of the uh, favorites of the theologians because this priest writes in detail all the things that are needed to know. And he was talking about the priesthood. And he says that the priest is such a great person, better than Mary, better than any saint at the time that he celebrates the mass. Because when he has the host, the bread, that is not host yet, is the bread. And he consecrates the bread, ex corpus meus. This is my body. This is so powerful that Jesus, the Son of God, the eternal God, submits to the authority of the priest and comes down. Whoa! Submits to the authority of the priest. We already study in all book of Hebrews that the priest cannot exist, period. But for that to happen, and then you remember Martin Luther when he celebrated his first mass. He was already into the Bible. And, but he believed this. And he came to that point of the Mass. And he says, he began to say, X, and began to shake. And the, his father was there looking at him and say, he's such an idiot. He even forgot the words. He did not forget any of the words. He was trembling to think that the body of Jesus will be in his dirty hands within minutes. He says, this is a great miracle. Hi, a sinful man are able, is able by the power of my words to bring Jesus out of eternity here and the, and the body and this bread becomes the substance of God. It appears bread, it appears to be wine, but it's no bread, it's no wine. That's how blind you can become. 
And then because the body of Christ comes in there and the Council of Trent says that whoever says that the body of Christ, the substance of God, is not in that piece of bread, even if you believe in Jesus, you go to hell. It's an anathema. Anathema. And then you keep this bread there and you worship this bread because it's the body of Christ. That's how horrible it is. And it says this, this, when they announce the, the, the mass, that is the sacrifice, that this sacrifice is going to impute your sins. It's an unbloody sacrifice, but it is a sacrifice. That's why in the Roman churches, you have the altar, because you sacrifice lambs on the altar. You have a table and the altar to sacrifice Jesus every day. The priest has the obligation to say mass every day under sin, if he doesn't. And then you kneel down. If you do not kneel down, you do not believe. And you are, you, 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 you are ready to go to hell. That's the... That's how serious Jesus said, you know, and I have to tell you again, I, and I have stories to tell you. I was teaching a conference and a priest walked in and he was listening and he got up and said, this man is trying to destroy from you the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the supper. And before the consecration, the supper becomes, uh, before the, the consecration, is bread. After the consecration is a host because contains the body of Jesus. Now, in John 6, Jesus says uh, in, in verse uh, 51 and so on, well, for all the way from, uh, uh, from 48, I am the bread of life, your fathers ate manna in the desert. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not to die. I am the living bread, verse 51, uh, which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats uh, uh, or of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give. For is the word, and then says, most assuredly, verse 53, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Uh, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will rest. For my flesh is uh, food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Wow. When this priest came in and read this, he says, you see that man? He's trying to take that away from you, which is the most precious thing in Roman Catholicism. And I was not ready for that. I did not know what to do says, answer me to that. How are you going to deal with that? And I was written to see this discourse of Jesus. 
And I was trying to pray that the Lord will give me an answer when they run the bell and they say, dinner is served, <laughs> the buffet is served, and then we'll continue this after the buffet. There was no dinner for me. I read and read and read. And it was not dinner, it was like little things, a little break. When I came back, I continued to read and I found the answer. And then when he finished, when he came in, he says, okay, what is the answer, Dr. Acosta? I say, please continue to read. You didn't finish. Because you arrive in verse 63. And what does it say in verse 63? It is the, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are the spirit and their life. See, why did he say that? Because when he was speaking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, they say he's talking about cannibalism. And some of his disciples at that moment left, remember? And then Jesus said to the others, do you want to leave too? And they said, where do we go? You have the words of eternal life. And Jesus says, let me tell you, what I was talking to you is spirit. <laughs> so in that is the spirit of the living God, of Jesus. But it doesn't come by the command of a priest. It comes as an ordinance for all the Christians who celebrate the, last, the Supper of the Lord. It's a time to spend time with the Lord in the spirit spiritual moment. And I have to tell you, I keep <laughs> getting now. We will never finish. But the moment of the supper is one of the most precious moments that you can ever have. Because it is the moment where the Lord tells you, examine yourself. Because if you do not trust in Christ alone for your salvation, you don't have the right to this supper. Because only the ones who believe and trust in Christ are the children of God. And only the children of God have the right to this supper. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Chapter 1 of John, verse 11, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Came to his own and his own did not receive him. But what? B-U-T. But those who receive him, who believe in his name, to them what? He gave them the right to become the children of God. So there are two kinds of people in the world, the children of God and the children of Satan. If anyone doesn't trust in Christ alone for your salvation, you are a child of Satan. If you trust in Christ alone for your salvation, you are a child of God and you have the right to have the supper of the Lord. Not for imputation, but as an honoring to the Lord to glorify God and to convince your heart and your soul that you trust in Christ. And in the biblical churches, they say, please, please, if you do, if you are not a Christian or you are under the discipline of a biblical church, please don't take it because this will serve you for worse condemnation. So this uh, it's a sacrifice, but this business, this tradition was not changed in the uh, Council of Trent. It was reaffirmed, indicating that it's a true sacrifice. Today, they will try to tell you that it's not, that it's just a celebration. They can say that so many times if you go time times, but if you go to the Council of Trent and you read this book, it doesn't say that it's not a sacrifice. It is. They have no change, but it is. Uh, sometimes I get, ah. 
verse number 27. That, that concept of the mass became a transubstanti transubstantiation in the year 1215. Would you believe that? In, in the first century, it was not the transubstantiation. It's not that the body becomes, the, the, the bread becomes the body of Christ. It's the spiritual. Jesus says, what I'm talking to you is the spirit. The flesh profits you nothing. So, uh, this transubstantiation indicates that you cannot even touch the body and touch the bread because you are touching the body of Christ. You have to have clean hands. They used to say that they, you have to, uh, to abstain from food for the entire night before you go to communion. Now is one hour. And so, it's an amazing thing. Imagine the Lord Jesus when he instituted the supper. It was at the end of the meal. They were full, you know, and he instituted that. Now, in Roman Catholicism, they don't drink the wine. They only give the bread. And the wine is only for the priests. And that was instituted in 1215. Before that was not transubstantiation. Imagine that. Jesus and the disciples, and you know, did not talk about it. Now, um, in number 25, I, I connected 27 because it's the same thing of the Mass. Now, on 24th, is the rosary, repetition prayers with bits invented. And I don't, I'm not sure if that is information is correct. I don't remember. I am not sure I had heard contradictions about who invented it, but it was invented at that time. And it was because of the veneration of Mary. Do you know what the rosary is? To repeat 50 Hail Marys and Ten? No, five Our Fathers. And you have to do that every night with the family or every day because that's the way the family stays together. And I remember praying this. And you, you are thinking of everything and you are repeating as fast as you can to go through. Well, that is prohibited by Jesus. Where? In right before the Our Father in Matthew chapter 5, where it says, when you pray, avoid vain repetitions. But I have fun with this when I teach in churches where they sing the same song 10 times. Because <laughs> they are doing exactly the same. Avoid vain repetitions. And you are praying to Mary. The first part of the Hail Mary is biblical. Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. She is grace. Full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, blessed are you, and, and blessed are the fruit of your womb, Jesus. That is there, and it was said for the first time by her cousin, Elizabeth, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth. But the second part was added. Hail Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now in an hour of our death. Amen. The hour of your death, you need to, to, to grab Jesus. <laughs> you, 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 know, you, you don't go to any other human being to try to be, that's the day when you say, Jesus, I trust in you. So this, and they still, and Mary, who, pardon me, and, say, and Satan, who appears in the form of Mary, <laughs> ask to pray the rosary 
to her specifically that the rosary is not in the Bible. That is not a message from heaven. If my message is, if an angel from heaven will tell you another gospel, do not believe it. Be anathema. Okay. The uh, the auricular confession of sins to a priest is instituted by Pope Innocent III at the Lateran Council. Isn't that interesting? 1215. Before, I didn't know what the priest did in order to confess the sins, but I, that I will have to review that. Uh, then, 29. The adoration of the host of the wafer was begun in 1220. Before they recognized it, there was transubstantiation, but they put an obligation to worship a piece of bread. How do you like that? It's sinful. It's, it is sinful. Jesus did not say, take and worship or take and eat, keep a piece and then worship it. Because what they do in the consecration of the, whole, of the bread is that they consecrate a lot of bread, a lot of waffles. And one big one is placed in the tabernacle to be worshiped. And there are declarations of worshiping. I remember in the seminary, 40 hours of worshiping the waffle. And we have to take place and all the seminarians will come and get up at three o'clock in the morning to worship for one hour and somebody else, so two other people will come worshiping. And we will look at that bread. We didn't think about God. It was, it, it was an amazing thing, but that is idolatry. That's worshiping the elements. Uh, okay, the Bible was forbidden to laymen and placed in the forbidden books by the Council of Toulouse in the year 1229. I better use my book. <laughs> in the year 1229. Why? Because before that, pardon me, before that, in the year 593, the doctrine of purgatory was established, and then people probably began to read the Bible and see that all of these things were in contradiction to the Bible. So in order to protect the church, you have to establish, to, to correct that. Um, then uh, this is serious because this stayed like that. And when I was student, in the seminary to become a priest, I never had a Bible. We never read the Bible. And people who now are bishops, who were my classmates, they never read the Bible. One of my classmates came to our home in Philadelphia as a bishop. And he confessed that he didn't read the entire Bible yet. And he was a bishop. So, that's the reason why it's another doctrine. Uh, in um, the year 1414, oh, forgive me, in the year 1251, the scapular uh, was invented. And it was invented on the tradition that the Virgin of Carmel, Carmel means brown, in uh, in Latin, 
and in other languages, in the Latin languages. Uh, and Mount Carmel is Brown Mountain. And Mary appeared there. And appeared dressed in what color? Brown. Brown. So she left the vestments when she disappeared. And then they cut little pieces. And with that, they left the scapular. If you go to any Latin country, the first thing that you see when you got into the taxi cab is the scapular. The scapular is a piece of cloth with the, with the figure of Mary of Carmel and, and then a little ribbon. And there is one in the back to cover your back and, now, and to cover your heart. So the scapular, you wear that, like you wear a, yeah. And if you die wearing that, she promised to come and take you to heaven after nine days. Nine days, anyone who dies in the Roman Catholic Church, they pray for nine days. After the nine days, they stop because the Virgin comes and takes care of them. It is, it, is, it is full of witchcraft. This is not a religion. This is terrifying. You know, I heard MacArthur again today saying, you know, another author saying, we have the responsibility to tell dear one, these dear ones the truth because the Bible says that these religions will make them blind will make him grow a heart that do not know the Lord. They are dependent upon other things. And then they claim that no matter how many scapularies they do, it doesn't disappear, the material. It is not true. It's false. But for me, it has become a tool for evangelism. Because the moment I get into a taxi cab, I ask the taxi, what is that? <laughs> and they try to explain to me. And at the end, they don't know how to explain. They say, we don't know, but we know that, that that's protection and that we, uh, I think that if we die with this, uh, we don't go to hell. And what an opportunity. Uh, it is so big, this opportunity, that I am proposing to have a missionary just drive right taxis every day. Because you have the taxi driver right there. And, and it is amazing, amazing, the conversation, but it has to be with respect. And to let them know, let me tell you the truth. There was a man like that in the uh, airport in Medellin. When you went, you went through the tunnel, but before you go through the mountains, so it's almost one hour. So in that hour, I presented the gospel to him and I shared with him the Bible. And I went through the entire Bible informing him. When we got to the hotel, he said, there's no charge, but you have to give me another hour. Can I come with you to the hotel? And we finished. And, and the same thing happened in France, right, Mimi? Uh, with another man presented the Bible to him. And when we finished, we went from uh, Nice to Saint-Tropez. When we arrived in Saint-Tropez, he says, I am not the same. I can't wait to get go home and share this Bible with my, my, my wife and my children. Because I said, if you do not present this to your wife and your children, you hate your wife and you hate your children. Because the, the, the message of salvation is there in that book and you have it. And if you don't give it to them, you hate them. Because how come you don't want them to be saved? And this is the reason why we do this. We love you. We love the Roman Catholics because it is so essential that you trust in Christ alone for your salvation. Otherwise, Anyone who doesn't ends up in hell. It's that serious. Now, uh, 
I never told you about the, the priest. So I told the priest about the 50, the, the, that 60, verse 63 in John indicates that he's talking about the spirit. I think I finished that story. In the 32, the, the Council of Constance forbid giving the cup to the people. From there on, only you take the bread, but you don't take the wine. In the year 1439, the dogma of, of Purgatory became the, the, a dogma of faith. The doctrine of purgatory became a dogma of faith. That means that if you believe in Christ, trust in Jesus, but you do not believe that there is purgatory, you go to hell. And in order to get out of hell, you have to pay to the priest to consecrate this bread for the dear ones so many times. And masses are different prices. If uh, there are masses that cost thousands and thousands of dollars, if it is if it is a very high mass with all kind of music, and if the bishop comes and celebrates the mass, but if a cardinal comes and celebrates, it's more money. So to get anyone out of purgatory, you have to pay dear ones. This is a simple thing. Purgatory does not exist. And it does not exist because the blood of Jesus is sufficient to pay in full for all your sins and to cover you, to present you blameless without sin to the Father. And that has to happen before you die. And it happens if you trust in Christ alone for your salvation. So uh, purgatory does not exist, but notice that when the indulgences were begun in 1190, number 26, was because the idea of purgatory was serious, but people did not believe because it was not dogma of faith. So in order to sell the indulgences properly, you have to make it dogma of faith. So you pay for your salvation. But guess what? Jesus says it's free. After the, 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 the suffering servant in Isaiah 52 and 53, you know, where there is the imputation of all our sins upon Jesus, in chapter 55 of Isaiah, he says, anyone who is hungry, come. Come without money. Anyone who is thirsty, come, is free. And is, is a free salvation for us. It cost the Father the life in the, of the Son of God. Now, notice that, that this is beginning to create the environment for the Reformation. Because the abuses were so great, so big, that there are histories of people who were physically punished because they did not uh, did masses for the dead, for the dead, or people who were physically punished because they will not kneel in front of the of the of the bread. They in 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 Spain there is a town where it's obligatory for the entire town to worship the host, and they organize this. It's almost like a four or five hour ceremony with all kinds of pumps and circumstances throughout the, the streets. In 1439, the doctrine of the seven sacraments was, was established. Um, it was a firm, it was a firm, was. And um, uh, in 1506, or 1508, the Ave Maria 
the Hail Mary. Part of the last half was completed 50 years later and approved by Pope, Pope Sixtus V. And that was at the end of the 16th century, actually, it says here. We are getting close to the Reformation, 1517. At this time, uh, Rome was founded, uh, was already founded, and it was established as really a center of the Roman system, uh, Roman Catholic system. And remember that at this time, Martin Luther visited Rome. And he did all kind of sacrifices and prayers because he was going to go to the holy city. And when he arrived and saw all the all the 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 scene and the and the, and, and, and the, the tremendous amount of anti-biblical beliefs. He was, he was totally surprised. We see, we have there the Scala Santa, where if you climb the scale, the, the, the steps where Jesus walked up to see Pontius Pilate. See, the, that steps were, was, was taken by the, I think it was the mother of Constantine from uh, Israel to Rome, and if you walk up those steps, you are guaranteed all your sins to be forgiven. It, uh, eternal, uh, you don't you don't go to purgatory. In uh, number thirty six, in fifteen thirty four, the Jesuits were. And the order of Je the Jesuits was, was established. Why was it established? Because they were in charge of fighting the Reformation. 1517, the Reformation come. The, it does a lot of damage against these unbiblical traditions. So they educate people to manipulate the scriptures and to fight back the reformation. A, a Jesuit cannot be ordained until he completes a long number of years of education. It's the longest um, seminary place where you can stay. Actually, I, I did not qualify for the Jesuits because I was not that intelligent. It's only, yeah. The current Pope it came from the order of the Jesuits. So you can imagine. Uh, in 1545, when the Council of Trent began, the authority of the Bible was declared equal to the tradition and equal to the authority of the church. So, sola scriptura vanished by them. And not only that, but at the Council of Trent, the uh, apocryphal books, some were added to the Bible, and the other ones who were already, uh, um, that, that were coming along during these years, uh, were accepted. In 1560, oh, we have the Council of Trent that began actually in 1545 and lasted almost 20 years. Uh, and with, an in, uh, uh, with the time in between, because there was war, but they, the Council of Trent is a serious matter. And I think for the next class, we will finish with the Council of Trent and share with you all the damage that the Council of Trent did that today never retracted. Never. 
when Romans and when uh, ETC evangelicals, ECT evangelicals and Catholics together agree, the first question that was asked was, so all the condemnation of the Council of Trent were abolished? And the answer is no, it stays the same. How can you agree when it condemns that anyone in the Council of Trent condemns that if anyone believes that he is saved by trusting in Christ alone for your salvation, let it be an anathema. If you deny salvation by faith alone in Christ alone and put it in writing, in order for anyone to become a Catholic, we'll have to deny the sufficiency of Jesus. We'll have to deny that salvation is by faith alone. Jesus did not come here to give the possibility to anyone to be safe. He came to save, definitely. He did not come to give a possibility to anyone to be safe. He came to save. So, and who did he save? He saved those that the Father gave him in John 17. He came to save his people from their sins. And those that he came to save, everyone will be saved. There is not a single one that will escape. <clears throat> um, in 1854, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary was proclaimed by Pius IX. <clears throat> Pius IX did a lot of damage. Uh, and I think we'll have to spend some time with him next time. But when Pius IX declared the Immaculate Conception of Mary, that meant that Mary was born without sin. And Mary never sinned after she was born. That contradicts the scriptures where the Old Testament says that there's no one without sin. And then Romans chapter three copies from the Old Testament and it says there is not even one, no even one. All had fall short of the glory of God. In Romans chapter three from 10 on, if Mary did not sin and was born without sin, she could have been the Redeemer. And if she is without sin, she was the only one who did not need Jesus. For what? But she called out in God, my Savior. Savior of what? Not only that, but they claim that Mary is not only immaculate conception, but she is virgin before the birth of Jesus, during the birth of Jesus, and after the birth of Jesus. Never lost her virginity. And she never had other children. But the Bible says that she did and gives the name. And then in Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says that if a wife denies the conjugal rights to the husband, it's a sin. So if she denied that to Joseph, he committed sin. No? If, any, if you want to know anything more about this, you have to attend my Corinthians class on Fridays at 7 p.m. So, some 
of the theologians in the Roman church, the Roman system, because it is not a church. To be a church, you have to preach the whole counsel of God, the entire Bible. You have to uh, exercise the two sacraments, the baptism and the, and the supper. And you have to exercise discipline of the church. If, if you don't have that, you don't have a church. So some of the people, some of the theologians says, you are Holy Father. Imagine that, Holy Father. That proclamation contradicts the Bible. There's no one with us in it. And that even contradicts the tradition because we didn't have this before. It's the first time. You're talking about 1854. How many years after the Bible was finished? And he answered, quote, quotation marks, I am the tradition. Close the quotation mark. And the dialogue about this continue and other things continue until the first uh, Vatican Council, which was in, 15, in 1870. And look what happened in 1870. Number 42, the infallibility <laughs> of the Pope in matters of faith and morals was proclaimed by the council. Now he has the infallible word authority to declare that Mary is the Immaculate Conception. And they have not changed that. And last week, the Pope, you know, consecrated Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Conception of Mary, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So you can see why this. Uh, Pius IX, believe it or not, in 1864, published a syllabus of errors committed in the church. Wait a second. The Bible is infallible. The Bible does not change, never change, and no one can dare to change anything in the Bible or to proclaim a syllabus of errors in the Bible. But this Pope proclaims a syllabus of errors in the tradition of the church. How do you call it in equal with the Bible? Or how do you call it the popes that were before, which is the magisterium of the church, infallible if these popes make mistakes. Syllabus of errors proclaimed by Pope Pius IX and ratified by the Vatican Council condemn, condemn the freedom of religion, conscience, speech, press, in scientific discoveries, which are disapproved by the Roman Church, and asserted the Pope's temporal authority over all civil rules. Wow! My kingdom is not of this world. That was it. My, that's what Jesus says. But these people proclaim that my kingdom is of this world. And they establish concordats. You know, have you heard that word before? Concordat is an agreement between the Vatican and all the governments of the world in such a way that many governments could not include anything in their constitution that will contradict the Roman Catholics. So that was, that was the law. And then, in order to assert this, uh, declare the infallibility of the Pope in faith and morals. And then, in 1950, that's yesterday. <laughs> in 
Mary ascended into heaven. <laughs> it's, it's sad. It is sad. And what is so dangerous about this? The assumption of the Virgin Mary the bodily ascension into heaven shortly after her death was proclaimed by Pius XII, one of the most corrupted popes who did not move a finger when millions of Jewish people were being exterminated. When they made an agreement with Hitler and he proclaims the assumption of Mary in body and spirit into heaven. That is serious because it contradicts the Bible, Thessalonians. When all the bodies will be ascended into heaven? When Jesus returns. And the ones who believed in Jesus and die, they will come up first and meet the Lord on the air right at Mount um, the Olives the olive guard, the olive mountain. And then the ones who believe in Christ and are alive will meet them. So there is no exceptions. That's for everyone. So uh, the, it, it, is an, it, it, is, it is something, uh, something horrible. Uh, because contradicts the Bible. Just the fact that it contradicts the Bible is already sufficient to run away from the doctrines like that.